for the for chairing this session nicely. Thank now you. I invite uh, Dr. Saurabh Verma. We are going to have the next talk by Professor Peter Masopus from Germany on fractals. So uh, I request Saurabh Verma to introduce the speaker and let uh, let us not delay anymore. Please. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so our next plenary talk will be given by Professor Peter Masapust. Peter, Professor Peter Masapust is a professor at Center of Mathematics, Technical University of Munich, Germany. He received his PhD in Mathematics from Georgia Institute of Technology, USA, and habilitation in Mathematics from Technical University of Munich, Germany. His areas of specialization includes abstract and applied harmonic analysis, Clifford analysis, wavelets, splines, and frames, efficient representation of multidimensional data via frames, wavelets, and fractals, etc. He has more than a dozen of research grants. He has received Fulbright scholarship and three visiting fellowships from Australian National University. He has published two research monographs, two test books, two edited books, and more than 100 peer-reviewed publications and technical reports. I would heartily invite Professor Masopos to start his talk. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. And uh, let me first thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present um, some of my research at this meeting. And so let me see what I can share my screen. Um, okay, and I hope you see most of it. Yes, sir, it is visible. Okay, wonderful. Okay, um, my presentation will uh, focus on um, basically um, fractal geometry and fractal interpolation theory, but um, it's a hybrid of um, two methods. Uh, first, we'll look at fractals, and then we'll look at what are called Clifford algebras and analyses. Okay, um, here's the outline of my presentation and um, as I wasn't sure how many of you do um, know uh, iterated function systems and fractals or some concepts from uh, Clifford analysis, I am going to start with a brief review of quaternions and some related topics. Then I will go over and very briefly uh, tell you what an iterated function system is and what fractals are and how you can use iterated function systems to construct fractals. Then um, we'll take an extension to the quaternionic setting and um, we develop uh, what are called systems of quaternionic uh, function systems. There's an S missing. And then uh, finally, we extend uh, the previous uh, results to what are called paradictive values and Clifford valued, um, to the Clifford valued setting. Okay, uh, what's the purpose of actually trying to merge these two areas of, of mathematics? Well, if you work in, or if you know something about fractal geometry, um, one method of constructing fractals is given by so-called iterated function systems. And the attractors of these iterated function systems are the fixed points, they are the, they are fractal sets in the sense of Mandelbrot's. Now, um, fractals that are generated by IFSs, iterated function systems, um, have a very important approximation property, uh, which is expressed by the so-called collage theorem. And the latter uh, theorem has um, tremendous applications in um, image compression, in the image analysis, and also, of course, in the description of natural phenomena, for which it is more important to use fractal methods rather than um, using classical approximation techniques. Now, the area of Clifford algebra and analysis well, grew out of Hamilton's uh, endeavor basically to 
extend uh, the complex plane to a higher dimensional uh, setting, preserving the underlying algebraic structure. And that was the birth of quaternions. Um, and since then, one has gone beyond quaternions to get so-called hypercomplex systems. And um, they all share the property of being non-commutative and also some of them are non-associative. But lately, people in digital uh, image, uh, signal processing have uh, discovered these hypercomplex um, algebras and um, tried to provide a holistic approach to modeling multi-channel data or multi-channel um, signals. Okay, so um, here is a very brief introduction to quaternions um, and Basically, what you do is you look at R4, <clears throat> Euclidean space R4, and, and its canonical basis. And you introduce a multiplication between the four elements in your canonical basis um, in this fashion here. So there is one element singled out, E sub zero, which commutes with all the other um, basis vectors in that fashion then we have a non-commutative um, operation among um, E1, E2, and E3 given by this formula here. Basically, that implies that EI, EJ is minus EJ, EI. And um, then you have this relation between all three of them. Okay, so um, if you then use this multiplication to find an algebra or define an algebra, you define what's called a real quaternion, I denote those by Q, in this form here. It's basically a real number A times E0 plus this part of real number VI times the EIs. And this first part in a quaternion is called the scalar part because pretty soon we'll set E0 equal to one. And the second part here is called the vector part. So you can think of these E sub i's, E1, E2, E3, as being um, generalized um, imaginary units, okay? And uh, similar to complex analysis or complex numbers, you define a, a conjugate, the several of quaternions by simply changing the sign in front of the vector part. And then, this allows this conjugation and allows it to define a norm on the quaternions given by this expression here, because it turns out that Q times Q bar is a non-negative real number. And likewise, you can show that there is an inverse to each quaternion given by this expression. And these formulas really remember, re resemble the same expressions um, you know from complex analysis. Okay, if you have Z, Z bar, then you can define a complex inverse. Now, the collection of all these quaternions for real numbers A, V1, V2, V3 is, uh, can be shown or is a four-dimensional associative non-commutative norm division algebra over R. So, um, we extended the complex plane or the complex line um, to into a higher dimensional setting, but we paid a price. We have non-commutative structures. Okay, so it's important whether you multiply from the right or from the left. Um, so, with quaternions, you can extend a lot of notions you're familiar with to this quaternionic setting. Um, for instance, you can look at quaternionic matrices. But then, of course, we, we know matrices, are, of course, are also non-commutative, but multiplication between matrices um, in the quaternionic setting also means that the entries do not uh, commute. So we always have to look at right and left multiplications. And um, so for the purpose of this talk, everything will be right multiplication. Um, so we first look at the right module of k by k matrices um, over H. So it means we multiply everything from the right. And every such matrix 
later capital H, defines a linear transformation from HK to HK. Now, what is HK? Well, this is simply the K-fold um, Cartesian product of the quaternions uh, defined the same way you would define uh, R to the K. Okay. And um, we know that every matrix, of course, induces a linear uh, transformation. So the linear transformation, capital L, would be in the quaternionic setting be written like this. So we multiply from the right. And what is important to us are functions on H, the quaternions. And these functions have the following form. They have a, and here I'm setting E sub zero equal to one. Um, there is a scalar part, and then there is the vector part. The vector part of a quaternionic function is um, given by or denoted by these f sub i's. And think of these ei's as being the three directions determined by the three imaginary units, e1, e2, e3. OK, and it is these functions that we will uh, deal with. Now, um, the elements in HK, I will call them vectors, and I will represent them in columns. And in order to define a norm on HK, we need the quaternionic conjugate, and it is defined very similar to what you would see in RK. The complex conjugate turns a column vector into a row vector where each of the entries xi1 through xi k um, also is um, conjugated. And um, for a matrix, we'll take its quaternionic conjugate star to mean that we, swip, uh, we, we swap the indices ij and take the quaternionic conjugate. OK, and the norm is defined in the usual way. You take the square root of psi star psi, and if you write that out, you get this expression here. So everything looks like in the, well, almost ordinary RK case, but from a point set uh, viewpoint, there's no distinction between HK and RK. But from an algebraic point of view, uh, there's a tremendous difference. Now, you can also. Um, once you have a norm, define a metric. And by construction, um, it's not very easy, not very difficult to show that HK together with this metric given here is a complete metrizable space. Okay. So, um, and for later purposes, we'll also need to define a norm on this uh, K module uh, or this right module of, of, of k by k uh, quaternion matrices. And you do it the same way you would define it in, in, in general for linear operators. OK, so um, this is basically a short, very terse introduction to, to quaternions. And now for the second part, um, of, of, the, uh, of the introduction, I need to tell you what an iterated function system is. Iterated function systems are very um, simple objects. You start out with a complete metrizable space with some metric V. Then um, first we'll define the Lipschitz constant of a mapping that goes from X into X. And it's defined in the usual way. If the supremum is finite, then we call the map F Lipschitz. And if it is even less than one, then we call it a contraction. And suppose I'll have a finite set of contractions on X, and I put them in a, in a family of functions called this script F. Then I call the pair X script F an iterated function system. So an iterated function system is nothing but a finite family of contractions on a complete metrizable space. OK, so how do I? get from this iterated function system to fractals. Fractals are sets, so I need operations on sets. Right now, I just have operations on, on points. So what I do is, with every finite set of contractions on x, I associate a set-valued operator. And we denote it again by script f. 
And this set valid operator operates on the non-empty compact subsets of X. Okay, and this is usually called the hyperspace of non-empty compact subsets, H of X. Okay, and for this hyperspace, I need to also introduce a metric, which we will do in a second. So what is the action of the set valid mapping onto non-empty compact subsets of X? Well, you just take the union, that's a finite union, of the images of one of these non-empty complex subsets under the contractions I have, or the mappings I have in my iterative function system. Okay, so this is an operation that maps compact subsets or compact sets into compact sets. Now, what I would like to do is, I would like to endow this collection or the space H of X with a metric. And that is the so-called house of Pompeo metric, and it's defined down here. It's basically taking um, two, what you want is two sets are equal if they completely overlap. Okay, so this is uh, given by uh, this definition here. So I started out with a complete metric space XD. I define an iterative function system on that, and now I constructed this hyperspace endowed with the uh, house of Pompeo metrics. Okay, now, it turns out that the realm of fractal sets is actually this H of X. And one can show that if that, remember XD was a complete metric space, the completeness of XD implies the completeness of H X D H. And even more, and that's the really important part of it, that the set valid app operator capital F or script F is also contractive with Lipschitz constant, the maximum of the Lipschitz constants of the functions in my iterative function system. So contractions on XD give me one contractive mapping on this hyperspace of non-empty compact subsets. Okay, well, we all know the Bonner fixed point theorem. Since the set valid mapping F is a contraction on a complete metric space, it has a unique fixed point. And this unique fixed point is called a fractal or a fractal set. And as this set valid operator F was created or constructed via an iterative function system, we also say that the fractal generated by I f of s. Okay, now we know by the fixed point equation that for script f, that every set f, non-empty compact, um, satisfies this equation, but then we remember the definition of script f, it's just this union of images of f under the maps in my iterated function system. So this is called a self-referential equation. Why? Because the fractal or the attractor capital F is a finite union of copies of itself under the maps in my iterated function system. Of course, each of these here, these f's in the argument of the little f, again, is a copy of images of itself, is a copy of images of itself. So you see, the self-referential equation basically represents the, the fractal features uh, or the fractal nature of the, of the attractor. So it's an object that in general does not simplify if you keep on magnifying parts of it or the entire image. Okay, now how do you construct fractals? Right now, that's just a um, existence uh, statement. Well, the proof of the Banner fixed point theorem also shows how you construct the fixed point. And what does it tell you? It tells you that you can start with an arbitrary, non empty compact subset of X, and you define a sequence from this F sub zero in this way here. You just simply look at the images of F zero under script F. 
And then the fixed point is the limit in the Hausdorff Pompeo matrix of these F sub n's. Now, of course, in practice, you cannot construct the fixed point. Uh, well, you cannot display the fixed point. You display, of course, uh, the F sub n's for a large n. Okay, so let me give you a couple of examples. Um, one on the left is yeah, a fractal, and the one is a very special one. I'll say something about this in a second. So the object on the, uh, on the left is uh, a fractal set in the complete metric space 0, 1 cross R, endowed with the normal uh, metric. And um, it's generated by these three mappings here. F1, F2, and F3. And if you look at this image here more closely, you see the three carpets it's made up of. So the whole image here appears here, here, and here. And of course, each of those appears in each of those, each of which appears in three other images. So you see that fractal nature of the object. On the right here is also a fractal set. It turns out it's a fractal set, which is the graph of a function. And such functions are called fractal functions. And um, this particular fractal function is constructed on the rectangle 0, 1 cross 0, 3, and is generated again by, well, in this case, by two mappings. And if you look at this picture here, you see the two images um, appearing in the graph, and then images of these images and so forth. And it's actually, um, these fractal functions we'll have to talk about uh, a little bit more later on. Okay, now here's the famous collage theorem. And in words, it tells you the following. Give me any non-empty compact subset in a complete metric space. Then, this non-empty compact subset can always be approximated arbitrarily close by a fractal or the um, attractor of an iterated function system. This is what it says. So what do you do is you f there exists an iterated function system consisting of n mappings such that if you can approximate the original um, given k by this finite union here to within some epsilon, then the attractor of this iterated function system approximates k to within epsilon over 1 minus s. Now, what's the purpose of doing this? Well, um, this collage theorem was used to compress images. It was used to compress data. And um, it uh, allows you to model naturally occurring objects, okay, clouds, uh, landscapes, um, trees, leaves, using fractals. Now, the collage theorem doesn't say that every non-empty complex subset is, well, it is actually a fractal in a very trivial case, a setting, but you can approximate the, these complex naturally occurring objects better by fractals than by means of classical uh, approximation theory, splines, polynomials, etc. Okay. Good. Now, okay, so I hope now you all know what an iterate function system is and what fractals are. And now what we're going to do is we want to construct specific fractals or specific iterative function systems where we use as our complete metric space, X, the space HK, so the kth power of the quaternions. We have seen, together with the, with, the, with the metric I defined a few slides ago, um, that I have, a, um, I have a complete metric space. So I define quaternionic functions. I suppose that they are contractive. So the pair HKF is in a quaternionic IFS okay, for a very specific uh, complete metric space. And now, if there is Fourier quaternionic IFS, a quaternionic attractor in the sense defined um, before, then you call this fixed point a quaternionic fractal or a quaternionic fractal set. And of course, it is unique by the Banach fixed point theorem. 
Okay. So how do you construct these guys? Well, um, it goes back to what I mentioned uh, before. As point sets, H, K, and R, 4 to the K isomorphic. Remember, H is a four-dimensional vector space or division algebra. And um, so there is point sets isomorphic. But the interesting part is that in the algebraic structure, they differ tremendously. You cannot multiply two vectors to give you an algebra. That makes no sense. There is no such thing as one over a vector. If you use quaternions, you are able to do that. So the algebraic structure here plays a very important role. And what are simple quaternionic functions? Well, right linear maps, as we discussed them before, they all have, or right linear affine maps, or right affine maps, I should say, they all have this particular form, linear part plus a translation, and introducing um, or using the norm on these matrices we defined earlier. If we can define H to be the maximum of these norms of those uh, matrices, if that happens to be a number less than one, then you can look at these AIs as being functions in my iterated function system, my quaternionic iterated function system, and therefore you have a unique fixed point which satisfies this fixed point equation or self-referential equation. Okay. And so you might say, all right, um, what do those things look like? Well, let's look at the case k equals 2. Um, so you consider very simple affine mappings of this particular form. Okay, and the q here is a quaternion given down here. Okay, um, and the vectors b1, b2, and b3 are also given by this expression here. Um, and one can easily show that the norm of this quaternion is less than one, while the norm of, of this matrix is then less than one. And so you have a quaternionic IFS consisting of these three mappings, all of which are contractions, so you have a unique fixed point. Question, what does this fixed point look like? Now, H4, if you want to depict it, uh, sorry, H2, if you want to depict it in eight-dimensional space. So that means whatever the attractor is, and we know it exists, we need to project it on subspaces, otherwise we can't plot it. So you can project it on two-dimensional subspaces of this eight-dimensional space or three-dimensional subspaces. And I did this here for a couple of, um, actually for three instances. Um, the first two pictures here are the projections of this quaternionic fractal onto the to the E0, E4, and E1, E7 plane. Okay, and you see there is a, there's an interesting um, well, geometric uh, structure here appearing. And here in the middle, I projected the attractor onto the E0, E4, E7 subspace. Okay, and you can do this for, for all the other projections. But you see, you know, the structure here is very interesting. Um, and um, you get, of course, differently, uh, differently looking uh, fractal sets uh, for these projections. Okay, all right. Now, the next idea is to say, well, so far, I considered a single set-valued map, either in my IFS or the quaternionic IFS as a special case. Now, what if I replace the single map capital F by a family of mappings. Okay, so in other words, I'm not applying the same mappings from me for my IFS at every step in the construction of my fractal. Okay, so to be specific, um, let's do the following. Let's stay in this in the space HKD and let TL now be a sequence of transformations on HK. Then um, I need to introduce this so-called quaternionic invariant set associated with the sequence TL. It basically says um, I 
if called the Quartinog invariant said, if this condition holds. In other words, it consists that the x in i are mapped into i under all the mappings t sub l. Okay, so that's an invariant set. The question, of course, is do they exist? Well, yes. Um, if you have a sequence of transformations on this uh, space HKD, if this condition here is satisfied for some x0, some s between 0 and 1, and some number m bigger than 0, then any ball, so that's a ball now, it's a quaternionic ball, um, of this form of radius greater than m over 1 minus s happens to be um, a quaternionic invariant set, actually also for all x's. So, well, for this x up here, okay, so if this is the x0 you find and you satisfy this equation, then this ball here is an invariant set. So applying then all these transformations to elements of this, in the, or to vectors, points in this ball, returns you to the ball, okay? So what is then in the case of our examples, we look at right affine maps, well, there is actually very simple. Um, it turns out that if you pick x0 to be the origin, um, if you pick m to be the sub of the translation parts bl, they're finite, and any matrix hl for which the sub here of the norm is equal to s is less than 1 will do it. So in other words, then every ball centered at the origin of hk of radius greater than this number here is a uh, quaternionic invariant set for this family of, of mappings. Okay. Good. Now, when you do these things, by things, I mean, if you look at these, at these transformations, then, of course, it's always important um, to keep track of well, which way do I compose them? There are two ways I can compose these backward trajectories. Um, so each of these set valid maps now has its own IFS and its own Lipschitz constant. And I consider what's called the backward trajectory of, of a starting set in H, script H of HK. And this composition is called the backwards map. So, and it turns out that backward trajectories are more interesting when it comes to the gener uh, generation of fractals. So this is what we call the backward trajectory. And um, it turns out that there's a result um, that says, okay, if I have a family of set valid maps, Okay, consisting of quaternionic contractions on HKD, if there is one of these non-empty, doesn't have to be compact, non-empty closed quaternionic invariant set, and if this condition here holds on the Lipschitz constants of these set valid mappings, then the backward trajectories converge for any initial set in I, remember, if my mappings are right affine mappings, then this is a ball, to a unique quaternionic attractor inside this invariant set. And um, you might say, okay, so what, I, what have I gained? Well, what you have gained is something very interesting. Here's an example. Let's just define set valid maps, F sub, script F sub L, using two uh, different, uh, script f's and f1 and f2 and so we have at first i mean we apply five times f1 followed by five times f2 followed by five times f f1 etc and f1 and f2 each consist of two mappings they're given here with the q1s and the q2 hats defined by these expressions and now i'm iterating this, um, these mapping script FL. What do I get? Well, I get two types of objects. 
What you see here is the projection of the attractor of the backward trajectory onto the E0, E4 plane at two different levels. On the left here is a level that is smooth. You get a straight line. If you now look at a different level, you get this twin dragon looking fractal set. Now, what does that mean? That means if I take a point here on the on the on this line and zoom in, I will see this image occurring at one point. On the other hand, if I take a point in this fractal and zoom in, then at one level I will have a straight line. And this is due to the fact that I'm looking at a family of iterations on the script val uh, on the uh, set valid mappings rather than just using one. So there you get a lot of with much more flexibility in constructing fractals which behave differently at different levels um, of resolution. Okay, now um, very quickly since I'm uh, running out of time, uh, going back to fractal functions. Now fractal interpolation theory simply says, okay, you want to um, construct a function that looks, well, you want to use fractal functions for interpolation approximation purposes. And the way you do this is by starting with a finite family of, of uh, contractions, mapping X into itself, generating a partition in this way. And the purpose of fractal interpolation is you can control the subsets Xi, okay? And what you want to do is you want to find a global, a unique global function that maps this partition into R where this global function belongs to some prescribed Banach space of functions and satisfies these n functional equations, okay, where the maps QIs and, and SIs are, are given and, and, and defined. Now, fixed points or equations or functional equations of this type can be solved essentially by turning them into a fixed point equation for an operator. And there is an operator in the background, which is called an read by Yaktarevich operator, which is given by this expression here. So the existence of this function psi is equivalent to showing that this operator has a unique fixed point. And then if you write out what that means, well, then you get exactly these n fixed point equations. Okay. And the existence um, of such a fixed point, i.e. a unique global psi, um, is guaranteed, again, by the Banach fixed point theorem, provided this operator T is contractive. Okay, and now we're going from quaternions to a general setting. So instead of R4, we look at Rn. We define, again, um, multiplications in this fashion here on all these n basis vectors. Um, and now what happens is, um, again, this is the equation that gives you the non-commutativity, really. The real Clifford algebra, R sub n, rather than R sub n, um, consists of points or of elements of this particular form. And what is this E sub capital A? Well, if you multiply things together, you get all these types of products. Now for the quaternions, remember there were some other conditions. It turns out that E1 times E2 is E3, E2 E3 is E3 is one. So you don't ever get out of, you don't get anything new. You don't get new imaginary units. In general, you do. And so these are best represented by looking at finite subsets of n sub n, so the numbers from 1 to n, and denoting these products by E sub a. And so every Clifford number has this particular form. And the dimension of Rn, regardless of real vector space, is 2 to the n because that's the number of uh, subsets of uh, the number from 1 to n. And these rules above here, 
make Rn into a non-commutative algebra. So in other words, it's a real vector space together with, with the bilinear operation multiplication. Okay, we can do the same thing we did before for the quaternions. You can look at the conjugation. Um, you can do the following. Um, I go back here. Of course, the empty set here is also a subset of NN. And E corresponding to the empty set, uh, you define this to be equal to one. Um, one has these properties to define the Clifford norm of this Clifford number to be the sum of these X sub A. So these are the coefficients of these, we can call them basis vectors, E sub A. And then um, you, you have your algebra together with everything. And you can then try to look at vectors, right, left vector spaces, etc. Okay, now a very important subset of, or subspace of, of R sub N is the so-called space of paravectors. These are Clifford numbers of this particular form. So they look like quaternions, except I have N of them now, and EIs rather than uh, three as before. And the space of paravectors is, is the real span of these, um, n plus one numbers were E zero can be set equal to one. And it's nothing else but R direct sum Rn. So a paravector can be identified with a vector in R cross Rn. And for many, many applications, this is exactly what you do. Now you might say, what have I gained? Why don't I just use vectors in R cross Rn? Well, remember, I have an algebraic structure, an underlying algebraic structure, which I do not have for vectors. And that is the big advantage of uh, looking at these power vectors. Now, unfortunately, um, A sub n plus one is not necessarily closed under multiplication. But if you multiply two of these guys together, you may not get back a number of this form here. So you need to um, introduce multiplication tables. Um, by simply saying what is EI times EJ in terms of all the other EKs. If you do this, and there are many, many different ways you can construct these multiplication tables, you in general get a non-associative, non-commutative algebra. And non-associative is really pretty, it's not very nice, let's put it this way. But um, engineers working in digital signal uh, processing have discovered these non-associative, non-commutative algebras, they call them you know, hyper-complex uh, algebras, to describe um, multi-channel signals. Okay, and well, for us, of course, you will see where we're going. We go to functions, so we need to say what is a paravector value function. Well, it's an object that looks like this. So remember, it looks like a quaternionic function for n equals three, but for the paravectors, um, paravector value functions, it's more useful to rewrite them slightly and separa separate out the scalar and the vector part. So you can write any of these functions in this form here. Um, it resembles really a complex function because here is the one is the real part this is the imaginary part and this is your well generalized i which is this vector here and prominent examples of paravector value functions for instance the exponential function sine and you can do all kinds of things okay and again one special type of paravector value function uh, is given by right linear transformations or by affine mappings and important is you need to map this, if you look at a n plus one to the kth power, so um, that you have an endomorphism rather than just a mapping, a linear mapping that goes from a n plus one k into r n k. Um, so what you do is you basically apply L, defined up here, and then you project it down onto the paravector value part of it. So you basically project out all pro, uh, um, products EI, EJ, and so forth. Okay, and then 
you get an endomorphism, so you map um, an plus one k into itself. Now, um, if you want to look at function spaces for paravector valid functions, what do you do? Well, you just take your favorite function space and tensor it over the reals with a n plus one. And then you get functions that have the following form. The f sub k's belong to your function space and multiplied by the e k's due to this tensor product here, gives you a function in f x a plus one. So it's basically keep taking um, ordinary functions along the different directions determined by the E sub case. And then you can do paravector valid fractal interpolation. So same idea. Remember the RV operator was important to show there's a fixed point for these, uh, or there exists a global fractal function. And um, the same thing here happens if you define an RB operator on this function space of, of paravector valued functions. And the way you define it is you look at an RB operator on your function space. There are plenty of those. And you define now an RB operator T tilde on this function space, which is nothing but defined as the sum here. Okay, and then you can show that if the T acting on your favorite function space is contractive with some Lipschitz constant, then this tilde is contractive on its function space with the same Lipschitz constant. So you can then um, construct a unique fixed point in this function space here that satisfies a paravector valued self-referential equation. So here is your global solution, which is now paravector valued. So basically what you do is you take your function and split it up into n different components along the directions determined by the EIs. And I might say, well, then why not use vector valued functions in the ordinary sense? Well, again, it goes back. I cannot manipulate factor valued functions. I cannot multiply a vector, well, an n vector by an n vector so that I get an algebra. I can do this for the um, paravector valued functions. So I get a holistic approach or methodology to describe multi valued um, data and, and images. And I'm if this one is done, once what you can do for paravector valued functions, you can do for Clifford valued functions. You define the whole thing accordingly, and here's a little diagram of how that would do. So you can then construct Clifford valued fractal functions and uh, so forth. And with that, I thank you for your attention and apologize for the uh, additional minutes um, I had to listen to me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much sir for giving a nice talk and informative info for this fractal geometry field any questions from the audience <coughs> manu hello yes you are audible please sir can you say about something dimension of quaternionic attractor um, the, <laughs> these quaternionic fractal attractors are very new. Um, so um, we haven't looked at that at all, or actually I haven't looked at it at all. Um, of course, you can, from a point set of view, it's the same as, uh, you know, just looking at, at the fractal. Uh, but the, the trick will be you, you can try to um, take the methods that are known from the classical phases and then try to the back. The non commutativity will play a big role. So one has to be extremely careful in deriving those estimates, you know, from uh, dimension calculations for, uh, shall we say, non quaternionic fractions. But no, I haven't done any of that. So you're welcome to look at it. It's it's certainly very interesting. Okay, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Vishal? 
This is my question is that we always consider a finite contraction mapping in iterated function system. But what happens if we consider a yes, finite yes, number of contraction mapping in the iterated function system? Um, historically, we one started out with a finite number, but of course that is not necessarily uh, the, the, the most general setting, you can look at a countable number of them. But then the problem is um, you can't really see what the attractor is if you have a countable number of mappings. There have been papers uh, or there have been groups of people looking at that particular case um, and found out something about attractors. You can look at subsequences uh, and you get different attractors that are subsets of each others so you can get you know sequences of attractors converging to the main attractor for the, un for the countable number of mapping so there's a lot of work that has been done i have not done this here yet um it's, it's worth by looking at it and of course you know i looked at the contractions i looked at were inspired by Lipschitz. so i need the banner fixed point theorem but there are other fixed point theorems that do not require shall we say, Banach contractions. You can look at more general contractions as well. So you can go in this direction too. Your slide is not coming, Dr. Watts. Is it coming then? Okay, any other questions? Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Any other questions? I think it is all right. We are running late. It uh, was a wonderful I'm... talk by Professor. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Really, it was really very good and uh, illuminating talk in the area of fractals. So I I thank Professor Masopust from the uh, on behalf of the committee of ICNAAO two zero two one. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure to um, talk about some of those things. Thank you so much. Also, thanks, Dr. Verma, who has actually uh, gave your name to call you. And certainly, I'm happy that you have accepted our invitation and given your talk. Well, now, thank you, Verma, for I that thank kind words. And now thank I you. request Professor S. Mukhopadhyay uh, to.